Welcome to Quantum Mechanics, a powerful framework for understanding the universe. Hi everybody, welcome back. Today we're going to be discussing matrix representations for angular momentum. So, before we get into this, we need to write down a few identities that will be extremely helpful for us in our calculations. So these four, 453 through 456. Now, these are matrix elements for J3, J squared, and J plus, J minus. These I expect you should be able to compute fairly simply. Look at the Kronecker delta structure for each one of them. J3 and J squared, the first two, Notice the m primes and m's, the bra and the ket. And j plus and j minus, well, we're going to have an m plus 1 and m minus 1 involved because they increase the value of m. Now you see where this phase convention in the previous section is important. All right. So... If we know these matrix elements associated with J plus and J minus, we can get the matrix elements associated with J1 and J2 because we can easily invert J plus and J minus for J1 and J2 because J plus is J1 plus IJ2, J minus is J1 minus I, IJ2, and so it's easy to, to see where these come from. Okay, now, the way what we're going to do, remember, is fix J, and then we have, a that's going to be the total angular momentum for the situation we're computing, and that's going to give us a, a, a range of um, M values from minus J to J in, in intervals of one half, increasing intervals of one half each increments, not intervals. Okay, j equals zero is easy. Why? There's only one eigenvector. So j equals zero, and m goes from minus j to plus j, zero. So it turns out you can check with the matrix elements that I just showed you. All the matrix elements are zero. It's one-dimensional. And uh, it's trivial. Now, j equal one half. This is famous. It's referred to as a spin a half representation. We haven't talked about spin. We're only going to do that briefly. But we first need to write down the basis, and then we can compute the uh, matrix elements in that basis for any operator we want. We're, we're focusing on the angular momentum operators. Okay. So here's the basis. It's two-dimensional. J is a half. That goes in first. And then M goes from minus a half to a half. Okay. And we get in that case one half, one half, and one half minus a half for the basis elements. Now I made a little template here. So you can see the format which this occurs. Okay, remember we have a bra on the left, ket on the right, bra on the left, ket on the right, and the operator which goes in between for which we compute the matrix elements of with respect to this basis. Now it ought to be starting to be clear why we needed a common basis for these operators. Okay, and then we have, see, J is the same in all of these. The only thing that changes is M. Okay, let's compute the matrix representation of J3 in this basis. We just put in J3 in the middle in my template. Do the calculation, use the four identities that I've already given you, and this is the matrix that we get diagonal with one, one minus one down the diagonal. 
Ooh, they self adjoint. All right, now we can compute the matrix representation for J minus and J plus in the same way. And that's pretty easy to do. I can verify my calculations. And using the fact that J1 and J2 can then be computed from J minus and J plus, this is what we get for the matrix representations of J1 and J2. Now, if we ignore the factor out in front of H bar over 2, H bar, it, we, in each case we get H bar over 2 times these three matrices. And these three matrices are very famous. This is the first one we looked at, J3. We call them uppercase X, uppercase Y, and uppercase Z. That's a traditional terminology. These are the famous Pauli spin matrices. Remember I said this was a spin a half representation for some reason? Okay, those calculations are pretty straightforward. What about J equals 1, the spin 1 representation? Okay, well, that's a 3... three-dimensional basis, three elements in the basis. The first entry is always J fixed, 1, 1, 1, then 1, 0, minus 1. Okay, this is a little template I've made, and you should check back with Chapter 1 that this is agrees with how you computed matrix representations of operators with respect to a basis. And this gets, I mean, it's, it gets a bit tedious once you go to j equal 1. j equal half, j equal 0, j has to be positive, j equal 0 is trivial. A half is, is, is very useful and interesting in applications. 1, okay, can be done. So this is j3. And this is what you get for J3. Now we do the same thing. We calculate J minus and J plus, and then we add them together in the right way to get J1 and J2. So that's J minus. And this is J plus. Okay. So this should... It should be clear that, I mean, once you develop all this apparatus for eigenvalues and eigen vectors and understand relations like this, which we used over and over in these calculations, calculating the matrix representations for a fixed J, which fixes a basis, because M goes but minus, minus, um, J to plus J. Okay. Incrementing by one. And we see easily hope easily, how to compute the matrix representation for, the, for any of the angular momentum operators, in, including the raising and lowering operators, the latter operators, J plus and J minus. And also, hopefully you see the necessity of a common basis to represent them all in. Otherwise, comparisons would not be straightforward. Okay. That ends this particular um, section of Chapter 4. There's a couple of details I want to come back, potentially. I mean, I, I can leave you to read those details. Those would be something about 
orbital angular momentum. I didn't say anything about explicit wave functions. That would be an important thing to discuss, and I will do that. Because in three dimensions, uh, it starts to get pretty complicated. That's why I didn't spend much time on it. You need to pick a coordinate system. When we did wave functions for the harmonic oscillator in one dimensions, it was really only the, the real axis, and x was a natural coordinate. But in three dimensions, you have <coughs> spherical coordinates, for example, or a number of other coordinates. Spherical coordinates are the traditional ones. And then you can imagine it gets to be um, algebraically and it's quite complicated, but I'll come back and say a few words about that. And then we have <coughs> one of the more fascinating stories in uh, quantum mechanics, which is full of fascinating stories, spin and the stern gerlach experiment. So I just want to describe that without going into huge amounts of detail. Um, but that's enough for today. And I'll see you all next time. Bye.